Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the sixth lecture of the Nanocharacterization uh, nano of Submeter Facilities uh, Summer Lecture Series. Today, I'll be presenting uh, X ray imaging and micro CT. And most of our users, they don't actually realize that at CNS, we actually have a micro CT system. And it can scan things on the order of a couple down to a couple microns. So it's an x -Tech system. It's a company, a UK company, which was later bought out by Nikon Metrology. So if you go to the Nikon Metrology website or our CNS website, you can get more information about our system. And this is open to all our users. It's a trainable tool. And I think this the instrument is arguably the most diverse instrument with a lot of different uh, backgrounds and uh, different samples. For those of you who don't know about micro CT, it's a very versatile and non-destructive non technique. It's, it can be used for 2D imaging, for 3D visualization, it can do sectioning or comparison of actual versus the uh, design part, for example. You can do measurements, metrology on your, uh, on your samples. It can be used uh, for quality control. If you are producing something, you can double check if it conforms with the original design. It can do porosity or inclusion analysis. It can also find defects or failures in parts and samples. You can check material densities if you have uh, density standards. And you can also do CAD to prototype comparisons. So if you have a CAD design, you can scan your prototype at the 3D model and then compare them. Are the for example, surfaces matching are the sizes correct. Or you can use it for other things like reverse engineering. And you can do these at down to micron scale. Today I'll be starting with simple, is what are x-rays and how do we generate them. And then I will go on to 2D micro imaging using x-rays. And then I'm going to explain how x-ray micro CT works in very basic terms. And then how 3D volumes are, can be reconstructed for, from 2D images. Then I'm going to talk about the rendering and visualization of 3D volume files, artifacts in the X-ray micro CT that you may encounter. And just give a couple examples of samples that have been scanned on our system. So what are X-rays? Let's start with that. X-rays are electromagnetic radiation, just like visible light, light uh, infrared, um, ultraviolet, radio waves, but at much shorter wavelength. So if you look at the magnetic, electromagnetic spectrum, visible light is a very narrow section over here. Infrared is on the left, ultraviolet here. And then you see there are two X-rays. One says soft X-rays and the other hard X-rays. Soft X-rays stand for lower energy X-rays, and hard X-rays, those people designate higher energy X-rays. Have more penetrating power for materials. And in, on our system, we can produce energies in the range of 30 to 450 kilo electron volts photon energies. The first X ray image was taken by Wilhelm Röntgen, and that was in, back in uh, 1895. And it was a very low energy X ray, and it was penetrating the bone. It's claimed that this is his wife's hand and this is the ring. And as you can see, the X-rays couldn't penetrate the gold ring because it's a much, much denser material. So we always face this dilemma when we are scanning samples, especially composite samples. So keep that in mind. X-rays cannot penetrate through everything. Certain materials are more transparent to X-rays than others. How do we generate x-rays? One way of generating x-rays is well, going to a facility like Argonne National Labs. That will be the very expensive way of generating x-rays. Synchrotron radiation. So what is done in this facility is they create very high energy electron beams, which then direct into auxiliary components, like bending magnets or insertion devices. And when the electron beam is deflected, 
um, the electrons will give off certain frequencies of X-rays. And then there are areas that, that synchrotron radiation can be taken out and used for experiments. And here you are seeing it as a blue light, not because it has a color, but because here it is turning oxygen and nitrogen atoms, ionizing them, and then, created, then they in turn they are creating the, the blue light. But the much more common way of getting X-rays, and also much less expensive way, is firing electrons at very high speed onto a metal target. So you do that in an X-ray tube or a vacuum tube, which has a hot tungsten filament where the electrons are produced from, almost like a light bulb. So there are the pictures of this tungsten filament next to a very uh, dirty penny. So I, I didn't have anything that's cleaner than that. And this is a microscope image, and you can see that it has a very sharp point tip. So the electrons will come out of that tip and you'll be accelerated under a very high voltage potential and towards a metal target. And they may reach velocities up to 80% speed of light, which will give them energies on the order of 30 to 450 kEV. And then they'll be focused by a magnetic lens into a very small spot. And this is important, making that spot is small, but it's very important. And onto the uh, surface of the metal target. And the sudden deceleration of these electrons will cause most of the energy to be unfortunately converted to heat. Maybe 99% of the energy, maybe more than that, will be converted to heat, but some of it will also be converted to X-rays. So this is just a simple drawing of a system like that. So this is the X-ray tube. It's a very simple and relatively inexpensive way of creating X-rays. Here's the filament. It's sitting at a minus potential. And here is our metal target, it's a bulk metal, usually made from tungsten, for example, or molybdenum. And it is sitting at the earth potential. A focusing cup will make a tight beam of the electron, and then the, that beam will be then focused using these magnetic lenses into a very small spot. And the X-ray is coming in this direction of this beryllium window, which is very X-ray transparent. The atomic number four it will come out as a conical beam from a very small spot. And of course, the tube is under high vacuum in order so that the electrons don't hit the gas molecules on their way. And this is a picture showing the X ray tube in our system. So the black part here is the high voltage cable and the filament is somewhere behind here, and this part is the magnetic lens. And down here is where the metal target is located, and it's cooled by water. The blue lines are water lines, so it's a water-cooled target. And you cannot see it, but there's a small window, a metallic window made from beryllium, which is the window where the X-rays are coming out. So when a High energy electron hits the metal target. It's not just one interaction. It will do many interactions with the atoms in the metal until it loses all its energy. So from one electron, it will be generating a lot of heat, but heat, but also uh, many photons. So the higher the energy, the more photons and more energetic photons will be coming out. And then you'll be using this conical shape X-ray is coming from a point source to illuminate our sample or imaging. There are two main mechanisms by which the X-ray photons are generated. The first one is called Bremsstrahl, it's from German. The radiation due to breaking or deceleration. So when a high energy electron does a near miss, the metal atom, it will be still deflected and decelerated and depending on the distance from the metal atom, it's going to be a photon, you know, photon energy that could change depending on these factors. So it gives off kind of a continuous spectrum, which will look like a bell-shaped curve. But from time to time, there will be events where the high-energy electron will collide. 
and remove an electron from the atom. Now, if that opening is on a very high low energy orbit, you know, it won't stay open long like that, so another electron will fall into that orbit, and it will give off a very specific wavelength photon. So the outer electron will fall into the hole, and the photon energy will be the difference between initial and final state of this transition. And because electron states are dependent on the material, there is tungsten, molybdenum, copper, these wavelengths will be characteristic to that metal. So at the end, using an X-ray tube, we'll get something like this. This will be the branch traveling or continuum radiation. Superimposed to that will be these characteristic lines from the target metal. And roughly, it will make about 5% of the all uh, X-ray intensity flux. This is spectrum showing an uh, the output from an X-ray tube. The black line you're, you're seeing is the unfiltered radiation trace. And here on the X-axis is the photon energy in the I2 units. And you can see the, the characteristic wavelengths in the form of these peaks. Now, we usually call this part, the lower energy part, the soft X-rays. And as, as, as we go right on the x-axis, will be hard x-rays. And soft x-rays can be detrimental depending what kind of sample you have. If you have very dense samples, like metals or ceramics or any kind of minerals, you know, soft, soft x-rays can create certain artifacts. And one way of getting soft x-rays is using a metal filter, like a copper, a tin piece of copper, in this case, I'm showing you the, the filter at 0.1 millimeter copper. Again, this is our dirty penny or uh, scale. And you usually buy them as sets, so there will be different thicknesses, so you can just take one out and then another one. And then you can get most of these soft x-rays filtered out, because hard x-rays have, have higher energy and, and a higher percentage of it will go through the, to the uh, filter material versus the soft x-rays. So you are here, what you're doing here is selectively filtering out the softer x-rays. Okay, so now we know how to generate x-rays. How do we use it for x-ray imaging? <coughs> it's quite simple. On one side we have our x-ray source, which provides us a point source of x-rays coming out in a conical shape beam. And on the other side, we put a detector that's sensitive to x-rays. And then we place our sample right somewhere in between these parts. And since the x-rays travel in straight lines, they will pass through the sample. And depending on how the x-rays are absorbed by the sample, they will cause different grayscale values on the detector surface. So how do we get magnification? Well, we just, because this is a geometric magnification, we just move the location of our sample. So if you want to have a higher magnification, we just move our sample closer to X-ray source. If you have a large sample, maybe we cannot move it, it comes out of the beam, then we have to decrease the magnification by moving the sample towards the detector. So sometimes I have users coming to me and asking, I have this four inch sample and I would like to scan it at the highest possible resolution. And I say it's not possible, we have to chop it down, we have to make it smaller. And it's the same, same is true in a typical microscope. If you are using 5x objective, you have a much larger field of view. And from there, if you switch to 50x, your field of view is going to, the area is going to become 100 times less. So the same is true here. As you increase the magnification, you need to decrease the size of your sample. Okay, so how do we calculate the mag uh, magnification? Well, on the detector surface, this magnification, you know, the magnification on the detector surface is calculated by similar triangles. So, this to this, same as this to this. So, you need to know the, the distance between the X-ray source 
and the sample, and then X-ray source and the detector. And it's the ratio. So the magnification will be the distance from source detector divided by the distance from source to sample. And again, it will give the magnification on the detector surface. But if you know the, the pixel size of the detector, then you can calculate what each pixel corresponds to in terms of your sample size, which is called voxel for volume element. As I mentioned, the working distance increases as sample size increases, so you have to decrease, uh, decrease the magnification. So these are just uh, very simple demo, uh, illustrations that show how you magnify image. As you get closer to the candle, the shadow of your hand on the wall is going to get larger. Of course, you are limited by the detector area, which will be the size of your wall in this case. So how do we image the x-rays? When x-rays hit certain materials, they cause them to fluoresce or phosphoresce. And when that happens, that light will be re-emitted as visible light. So you can capture it using, for example, a CCD camera. CCD being made from silicon is not sensitive to x-rays, so it cannot really detect x-rays, but it detects visible light very well. So most of these detectors, they have a screen that takes the x-rays and converts to visible light, like a phosphorescent screen, fluorescent screen. And a typical CCD camera will be you know, 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. And in this case, the image is produced in the screen, and there's a camera on the back that captures that image optically. But on our system, we have a different setup. We have a very large silicon flat panel detector, which is on the surface coated with fluorescent screen, which converts the X-rays to visible light. And then the light sensitive dials right behind that screen collect them directly. So there is no optics involved. Just each pixel directly collects the light that is generated on this phosphorescent screen. In our system, we have a 2,000 by 2,000 pixel array which is quite large. And each pixel is 200 by 200 microns. So this is an important thing to know what the pixel size is because if you are working at, for example, 10 times magnification, so your sample is 10 times closer to the X-ray source than between, uh, compared to distance between the source and the detector, then you can easily calculate what your voxel size zone is going to be on your uh, image by dividing this value, 200 microns by 10, which is the magnification, so it will be 20 microns. And our detector is 16 bits, so you can you get 65,536 shades of gray using this detector. Whereas compared to human eyes, you know, I read some it's only a 50, 60, and another source said it's about 200 shades of gray that can tell apart. But there are other imaging architectures, not the only one. But this is the, the conventional architecture that I, I have just shown you. It's like a point source, a sample, and the detector detects it directly. If you go to a synchrotron source, such as Argonne National Labs, then you will have a collimated beam. So the beam is not expanded. Light is coming, the X-rays are coming parallel to each other. So you need to do an optical magnification later. So you need to take that scintillator screen and then optically magnify it onto a detector. And Exadia, recently brought, brought out by Zeiss, have a different architecture. They combine both. So they have this conventional CD architecture on one hand, and then they also have optical magnification on top of it. And they claim they get better resolution at different, uh, different magnification levels. Now, we talked about the electron beams needs to be focused very well into a very fine spot. And why is that? Why, why do we care? In order to get a sharp image, you need to have a very small spot size. 
So if you have a small light source like this candle, you're going to get a sharp image. But if you are using a larger source, as illustrated here by this window, you're going to get a blurry image. So your ultimate resolution is going to depend on the size of the spot that the electrons are focused and the x-rays are coming from. Now most people think, okay, if I increase the voltage, if I increase the power, I will get better resolution. It's the opposite. If you increase the acceleration voltage of the electrons, now the electrons have, have higher energy, and when they hit the metal target, they are going to penetrate deeper. So there's going to be an interaction volume seen here. So this diagram shows the increasing energy of the electrons. So as it increases, as you see, the interaction volume increases as well. And the, since the x-rays are coming from the whole interaction volume, you are making the spot larger by increasing the energy. On the other hand, if you are using high atomic number materials, for example, tungsten is a, uh, further down on the atom, uh, periodic table compared to molybdenum, you will decrease the interaction volume. So you need to decide what you want to use, what kind of energy you want to use for the electron beam and what kind of target you want to use in order to adjust these parameters. Now, here are some applications of X-ray imaging, just 2D. Now, there are medical applications, that's most common probably to a layperson. There are industrial application, electronics, in casting, mechanical engineering. And also, there are applications for seeing inside things without breaking them. But there's a major drawback of 2D X-ray imaging. So far, we have been talking about 2D imaging. There is no spatial information in the third dimension. So here I'm showing you the scan I did, just one image of my Fitbit Flex personal activity monitor. So I'm not really making advertising, just this is something I was interested in seeing inside, so I scanned it. And if you want to see again, this is our dirty penny and it's next to it is the the insert inside, so it just goes in like that. <coughs> and by the way, it's not levitating. There's a foam underneath, so which is kind of transparent. So it looks like it's flying off the stage, but it's not. So if you look at this, you see a very dark structure here. But we don't know if it's in front of this circuit board or behind it. So how can we determine that? Well. Once you start rotating the sample, then you can start seeing the relationship of that feature with respect to that circuit board. So now you are seeing that the circuit board is actually is in front of that dark thing. So it's 45 degree rotation, another 45 degree, another 45 degree. And now we know where this dark structure is with respect to the circuit board. And you, if you do this enough, then it can pinpoint the, the 3D location of each of these features inside your sample. And that's what X-ray micro computer tomography is, or micro CT is. It is the process of imaging an object from all possible directions. So you are rotating a 360 degree while taking images, projections. And then using a computer to reconstruct the internal structure of your sample. And in the case of medical CT scanner, you usually put the patient down and then rotate the detector and the source around the person. We don't, we don't have that kind of restriction, so we can just rotate the, the sample. So, and this is much more robust because there's a very stable frame on which this source and detector are um, mounted. It's a, this doesn't have as, as much mass, so it's easier to control the rotation of the sample than rotation of these larger parts.
So now I would like to shift gears and talk about a little bit about the X-ray attenuation. And the way the X-rays are attenuated is material dependent. So just very simply, if you look at this image of the Fitbit, you know, we can see the metals and they attenuate X-rays much more than the plastic casing around it. So metals are darker and then we have plastic, this bottom part which is the sample, there's also plastic. And there was green foam underneath, which is not even visible because the X-rays are just going through. It's almost like background. And air also gives the background grayscale value, which is brighter than all of these materials. And just a rule of thumb, if you take the periodic, periodic table of elements, as you go higher on the Z, you have more attenuation. But of course, you have to, you have to compare density as well, because you know, if air, if you compress it into a liquid, then it's going to attenuate more. It's also the density dependent. But if you are just comparing metals, usually as you go higher on the Z, you get more attenuation of the X-rays. So then, what do the CT volumes measure? So the CT mo uh, volumes measure the X-ray linear attenuation. So when a ray is going through, X-ray beam is going through the you know, material, how much does it get attenuated? I'm not going to go into detail, but it's an exponential uh, function. So it's a negative mu t t is the material thickness. So as you increase the thickness, the measured intensity is going to decrease. In the same way, the mu is the X-ray density or the attenuation coefficient. As that increases, also the measured density is going to decrease. And then in order to create a volume, what you have to do is again, you have to collect all these projections while you are rotating your sample. But one important requirement is that the X-rays should be able to penetrate your sample from all orientations. So if you take a sample like this, and you decide you are going to mount and rotate it like this, it may not be the best way. So in this orientation, the X-ray may be going through only a thin region, but when it's head-on, they have to travel all the way through the whole length. So if you insist mounting your sample like that and rotating like that, you have to make sure the X-rays will penetrate and come out from the other side on this long axis. Or just simply, you can just flip it up and then rotate it like this. So time doesn't change. So now we have the X-ray source, and we have the detector and our sample on the turntable going around. When you put a line and look at the grayscale values, those grayscale values should never fall below a certain limit. If they are very close to the, the noise levels of your detector, then you are not really imaging those areas that are really dark. But once you have successfully finished the scan, we'll penetrate it and send it to the, uh, to the computer algorithm and it will do what is called the reconstruction. It will take the projections and create the volume. So this is your sample and the x-rays are coming from the source. And they will be attenuated by these parts of the of your volume. And the idea is using these projections to create this deconstructed volume. So how it's done? It's done by a method called back projection. So let's suppose we have a very simple sample. The white area is maybe made from foams, it's more or less transparent, and we have three structures inside that are much denser than the rest of the matrix. So what we are doing is first is you know, putting the detector on one side and then exposing X-ray light. For simplicity, I didn't use the conical shape B, but parallel B. And then 
Once we do that, we are going to get some grayscale values. So this is a 2D image. We collapsed our sample into a 2D. Because the X-rays went through one structure here, it's a little lighter than this structure. The grayscale values in this area, which is darker. So if we do that from, let's say, four different angles, 0, 90, 80, 70. Then when it's time for reconstruction, we can back project the grayscale values of all these pixels into the volume inside. So we'll be doing this, intersecting everything, and then adding those up. So when these dark regions and up here, it's going to create a denser region inside the volume compared to these light regions, for example. Just to give you an idea, I'm going to show you how these editing projections work. So I'm going to show you a couple reconstructions. In this case, the first one is done by four projections. There's four images that have been back project into this space. You cannot tell much. I mean, you can just say, maybe there are four different structures in here, square. All right, let's increase the number of projections to eight. Now it starts looking like we don't have four, but it looks like we have two areas that, are, that have some kind of sample in them. Let's go to 16. And of course, the quality increases every every step. So now we are seeing maybe they are not really square, but they look like round, two round structures. So we can keep doing that. 32 projections, 64, and 128. And it's just only one slice. So this is uh, kind of like a horizontal slice of two objects that look round. Can you guess what they are? Difficult probably, but... Well, two batteries. <laughs> yep. So, those, pro you know, those uh, projections, <coughs> or the reconstructions were done in this middle slice. Uh, two small E90 batteries. And then the question I get very often is, how many Im images do I have to collect for a good, successful CT scan. And it depends on many, many things, but what you have to make sure is that when you are rotating your sample and taking projections, you have to make sure the edge of your sample, the most outside, the areas farthest away from the center of rotation, do not move more than one pixel size so that there's always some overlap. So you never have empty space or no data in certain regions. So if you are scanning a small sample in the middle of the detector, only a small area, you don't have to collect as many projections. But if you are using the whole detector area, you know, larger sample or high magnification, the outside is rotating quite fast. So in order to fill that in, you have to increase the number of projections. So at the minimum, you need at least about 1,000 for a typical scan, but for collect everything in a reasonable amount of time, most of the typical scans are done you know, within 25 minutes to 50 minutes. If you think about one second exposure per projection, you know, in about 50 minutes you can collect uh, 2,200 images. We talked about the importance of spot size. But it's not the only thing that affects the resolution. There's also the resolution due to contrast, or resolution you may not get due to a bad contrast. So in this figure, there are these two dark dots. And when you go towards the bottom, they get closer and closer to each other. And these five different regions show the effect of the background to 
know how easily you can see them or s separate them from each other. So when you have a high contrast, meaning that the grayscale values of your sample are much lower, meaning towards the black compared to the background, you can easily tell them apart. And you know, they can tell when they start touching each other. But it's not the case if you don't have good contrast. If you had if you had a histogram, we'll see in this case, you know, there will be just one peak instead of two peaks, one for the background and one for the sample. At that point you cannot really separate things. <coughs> So what do you have to do in order to get good contrast? The first thing is, you need to adjust the energy of the electron beam. You do that by adjusting the acceleration voltage for the electrons, such that you, you get an appropriate X-ray power for your sample. So for, for example, you need to get soft X-rays or low energy X-rays for biological and polymer samples, and higher energy, harder X-rays for denser samples such like minerals and metals. Then as I mentioned, the sample must be penetrated by X-rays in all orientations, but also penetrated above the noise background. So you, you would like to have about maybe 10% 10, 10 of the dynamic range above the, the noise level. And finally, the X-ray flux, which is controlled by the current, how many electrons per second you are shooting towards the metal target, must be adjusted to get a background grayscale value that's close to white. So it basically spreading out everything towards white in order to spread the peaks in the histogram. And by the way, getting good contrast for composite samples, meaning that samples that are made from materials like uh, very different materials like plastic, silicon, and several different metals could be very challenging. Because in order to get a good image of the metal parts, which are densest, what you have to do is you have to increase the power of the X-rays, which will penetrate metal. But then what you are doing is they are so powerful, you are making the plastic or very low density parts of your sample transparent. So they are losing contrast. So you are, they are kind of becoming the background. And that was the reason you couldn't see that foam that was holding the Fitbit and looked like it was levitating. Another important step in getting a good scan is doing a very good shading correction. Shading correction is the detector calibration that you need to do before starting the scan in order to get a uniform background. So don't assume that the pixels on the detector will be all the same. On our detector, we have 4 million pixels, 2,000 by 2,000. And each, every single of them will show you a different value if you do not do the shading correction. So by doing the shading correction, you collect, for example, a white image without your sample and a black image and then assign the values on that image to each of the four million pixels and say, okay, this is your white, this is your black. Now the second pixel, this is your white, this is your black. And the end result will be when you collect that image, it will calibrate the image such that if you just have background, everything is going to be white, about the same level of grayscale. So at least two shading correction images needed, so one is black, one is white, but on most systems it will allow you to collect more. Maybe the sensitivity of the detector may not be linear, so you want to collect some grayscale images as well in order to fit a curve instead of a straight line. Just to give, give you an idea, I don't know if you can see it, there might not be better. Okay. This is the background without the sample before the shading correction. I don't know if you can see it, but there are these striations and areas that are a little darker. The corners tend to be a little darker because by that time the beam is expanding, not coming straight on, but at an angle. And the second image 
is the background after shading correction. So everything has, all the pixels show a uniform grayscale value. If you don't do this, now this pattern, in this case these stripes, because this detector was made of uh, different pieces of CCD elements, which were patched together, and each has a slightly different sensitivity. And this will be superimposed on your sample and cause uh, artifacts. But in my opinion, the most important part is the sample mounting for getting a successful scan done. The poor sample mounting is the most common failure mode on, on scan. So if your sample is not stable and moving during the scan, then it's not most probably either you're going to get some artifacts or it's not going to construct. So the sample should not move during the entire scan, <coughs> except the rotation of the sample, of course. That's the controlled movement. I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to random movement. And this could be especially difficult to achieve with soft, elastic, or wet samples. If you have a tissue sample and you're trying to scan it in air, when it's drying off, it's changing its shape. If you have a viscoelastic sample and you, put, you hold it and you put some force on it, it changes shape and you put it on the stage, start scanning, it will, it will relax. Even the, a small temperature change inside the chamber can affect it because the sample stage is made, made from metal. If you heat metal, it will expand. Now, uh, afterwards, if you are cooling the metal, it will retract and move your sample during the scan. So the environment inside the chamber is also very important. Desert foam, also known as dry foam or florist foam, is a very good way of mounting samples because it is very brittle. So if you press on it, it will, you know, you break it or you are making a hole but it's not elastic, so it won't bounce back. But this is how I mounted the fit with flex. It looked like it was levitating. And on the bottom, I used carbon tape to attach the desert foam on this plastic stage. Carbon tape is used for SCM imaging, for example. It's a very stable, double sticky tape, which doesn't have much creep. If you go ahead and use double sticky 3M tape, on the other hand, and some users did, I can assure you that your sample is going to move. Because that tape is very viscoelastic and depending how much force you do, you put on it, when you're mounting your sample, it's probably going to get compressed and then relax in the skin. All right, in micro CT in practice, some of the artifacts, uh, when you're collecting the CT data, could be motion artifacts, it may appear as double image or some blur, or you may not be able to actually reconstruct the volume. And this is what I mentioned about why you have to mount your sample very stably. There could be some center of rotation errors. The assumption is the center of the detector should be lined up with the center of rotation of your sample. But it may not be true, it may be all off, it may be tilted. So it needs to be calculated. So there's a software program that calculates it. But it's not always successful, so in some cases you may have to do a manual determination of center of rotation. If you have a wobbly state or instable state, sample mount, that will also cause similar things to Martian artifacts. If you do not collect enough projections, that's called undersampling. You have gaps now, it's not going to generate a nice uh, 3D reconstruction. It, may not, it might even fail to construct it fully. Noise may appear as speckles in this you know, slice of images. You know, how to get rid of noise? Well, you have to elevate the grayscale values above the noise level. So you have to have, even in the darkest regions of your projections, you have to at least 10% of the dynamic range above the noise level, the black level. You may have ring artifacts that may appear as rings if you take a uniform structure and then do a reconstruction and then make a slice. 
these ring artifacts appear as concentric rings around the center of rotation. And they are caused by what I call bad pixels. Not dead pixels, but bad pixels. One pixel that is, for example, a little brighter than the neighboring ones, or that's darker than the neighboring ones, can create this bright and dark rings. And then there are streak artifacts and scatter radiation. And streak artifacts I usually see at the edges of dense structures in the sample. And unfortunately, X-rays not always penetrate the sample. They can get scattered or reflected from surface. And uh, interfaces, so it can drag the poles and fill other angled areas. Unfortunately, like everything else in life, it's the competition between speed versus quality or time versus noise. And the most important thing you can do is getting very good signal to noise ratio when you are setting up your scan. And you can do that by collecting very low noise projection images. And collecting enough of them so that you can create the, the volume. And this is achieved by maximizing the maximizing detecting X-ray dose in each image. If you, you have a background peak, so you, you try to, to set that background close to saturation, or close to white. That way you are using the most dynamic range of your detector. Here's an example of random noise. So this is a slice for a cylindrical shaped object, uniform object. As you see, it's pixel values are varying a lot inside. And this is another slice which is less noisy, more uniform inside. So as I mentioned, the CT quality is going to depend, it's going to be proportional to the number of detect X-rays for each projection. And you can maximize or increase detected X-ray dose by increasing the number of projection of images. It will also help with the resolution. So instead of taking 1,500, you take 3,000. You have more data. Overall, you have collected more dose for that whole scan. You can increase the camera exposure you have one second exposure, maybe your background is somewhere in the middle of your detector range. You can double it, make it two seconds, and for the, then the background will shift towards white. You'll get definitely better images, but that will also double your scan time. <coughs> you can start doing uh, frame averaging. So for each position of your sample, instead of taking one image, you can take four images or eight images and average them out, which will help decreasing the random noise. You can increase the X-ray current up to a certain point. We have a top of about 15, 15 watts of maximum power for our system. Beyond that, you may start melting a hole in our target, so you are limited by that. And voltage times current is how much power you're applying, so if you increase current, you're also increasing the power. If you are using a filter, you can try using a thinner filter in order to pass more spectrum, a larger portion of the spectrum, and then hence collect more x-rays. And then you can also uh, increase the x-ray voltage, but you have to be careful. When you increase the x-ray voltage, your image will get brighter, but also if you had some very soft parts of your sample, they will start becoming transparent. Don't ever do this in order to increase the total dose, which was like increase the detector uh, gain. It will increase the signal as well as the noise. So segment signal to noise doesn't change by increasing the detector gain. And don't do detector binning, meaning that you are going to, for example, take four neighboring pixels and then add them up into one pixel. Then you are decreasing your resolution. So 2,000 by 2,000 detector suddenly becomes 1,000 by 1,000 detector. All right, so let's a little bit talk about uh, some of the applications we have. I think we have another five minutes. So some examples you know, would be some industrial sam sam samples, such as, in this case, the USB memory stick. And LED here, they false color the silicon part. The solder joints, this is an injector from a diesel engine's uh, injector head, and some uh, voids, you know, solder joints, 
some fossil samples, some archaeological samples. And I'm going to start with a fun example, which is Mr. Froggy. Mr. Froggy is a wind-up toy, uh, which does backflips. And I was curious, how does it do that? So, put in the, it's a micro CT. So here it's mounted inside. We rotated 360 degree, collected multiple projections. So here are the projections. And you can already see from the 2D that it has something inside that's darker than the outside plastic. Most probably metal. And then from those, those 2D projections, the 3D volume was reconstructed and visualized using a program called the Studio Max. And once you have that, you can beautify it. You can color it, like the original color. So it looks more handsome in green than in, in white. But you may say, hey, well, where did the eyes go? Well, the eyes were just painted on, so it's not going to show up on the micro CT. So you can add that by Photoshop later. So now it has eyes. And well, if you don't like the color, you can give it like a nice blue eyes. And then you can start looking inside. So you can do cut away views. Outside plastic. You have the you can see there's some metal metal mechanism inside. You can strip away the plastic components and then it will show you the metal components. You can even generate you know, 3D stereoscopic images. I'm sorry, I have only one. So you are not going to enjoy what I am going to. <laughs> well, it literally jumps out of the screen. And then, of course, everybody asks, how can I make an animation? Here's one, this is the Fitbit Flex. So you can use the same software that you use for visualization and rendering. Create animation like these. So this is the, the inside Fitbit Flex. Rotating it, you can zoom in, you can see the individual wires. And then we can even create extract volume of the metal, put it back in, and the strange things. It's great for PowerPoint presentations. Uh, another industrial example would be, okay, how does this compact processing bulb work? What, what do we have inside? Well, this is the 3D rendered image of the fluorescent bulb. And then you can actually create this is like semi-transparent, but in, if you want to render it solid, you can do that. You can create a skin or a surface. Now this is binarized, it's either solid or air. And then you can start stripping different density materials. So there was some plastic part, we stripped it off first, and then the glass goes, and we have left with metal and some denser parts of it. And then you can leave just the really dense parts, which are the denser metals. And then you can also, again, create an animation out of it. Ah, OK, let's go to some biological applications. This is an animation of a fruit fly. And I saw I didn't kill it, it was dead. I found it dead in the kitchen. So I brought it to CNS, put it on a desert foam. Now you can't see the desert foam actually, you know, these are the little uh, interstitial space. And it's lying on the side, rest in peace. And this is extremely difficult sample, because it has not been stained. And carbon being a very high up on the periodic table doesn't attenuate x-rays much. So it's mostly made from carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, those kind of things. But by adjusting the x-ray energy, like set it to soft x-ray, low energy x-rays, you can actually get attenuated and then reconstruct it. Another biological example, I don't have the animation, but this is done by Monica. So this is the butterfly head. 
in a 3D view, and she was actually sectioning it, I think, and using this uh, plane. Again, this has not been stained. Uh, no. Oh, no, I don't think so. And I, I saved the best to last. So this is amazing. <laughs> Somebody came yesterday, a user that I, whom I trained last week, and he got his certification yesterday by Monica, and he brought 86 million year old bird bomb. It's a fast 86 million year old. You know where it was found? It was found in marine sediments in Kansas. By the way, Kansas was a sea at that time. So it's that old. It was scanned by, I should give credit, Daniel Field from Yale and Professor Park Anjan Buller. On our system last night, I was preparing the slides, they were scanning. I said, I need to put that on my presentation. And it's from uh, Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History Collection. Uh, this is a dime, it's not my dirty penny anymore. So these are fossilized, but it's amazing. And they said that this bird called Ichthyornis, I don't know if I'm reading it right, aka fish bird, which had teeth, it's a transitional form to the modern day bird. So it is like Homo erectus to us. But, and they even mentioned, I think Charles Darwin saw the, this, this thing. You know, it's that old. I don't know how they took it out of the museum though. <laughs> I have no idea. And they reconstructed it. So I made an animation out of it. There was actually a crack that was fixed later, but you can see, you know, bird bones are usually hollow, and you can see that it's hollow inside, which is a different material, because it has been fossilized, so all the original material has been replaced with minerals, but... Well, as I said, it's a very versatile system, and it's available to our users for a very, very low fee. And we also have three reconstruction computers that serve it. And on these computers, we have the Digi Studio Max software for 3D rendering and animation and visualization, as well as Amira, which is a similar software. And for volume reconstruction, we have CT Pro, uh, 3D and Inspect Export Acquisition. So it's a very nice system. We give trainings every other week on Thursdays. If you're interested, just let me know or sign up. And at this point, if you have any questions, any questions.